Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoan parasite of the phylum Apicomplexa. It is distributed worldwide and can infect all warm-blooded vertebrates, where it develops as an obligatory intracellular parasite. Its final host is the cat. With feces, the cat sheds environmentally resistant oocysts. These sporulate outside the host to infectious stages. For the development, called sporulation, humidity, temperatures of about 20 degrees Celsius, and sufficient oxygenation are required. Inside the oocyst, at first, two sporoblasts are developing. Within the next two days, they become sporocysts. They are now surrounded by a wall, and each contain four sporozoites. Having entered the intermediate host, excistation occurs in the lumen of the intestine. Under the action of intestinal enzymes and bile salts, first the oocyst is opened. Here we see one isolated sporocyst still wrapped in the ruptured oocyst wall. With digestion of the sporocyst envelope, the parasites are eventually set free. Once more, the process of excistation. The parasites are termed sporozoites, and are the organisms infectious to all intermediate hosts. Sporozoites are formed as elongated cells of 7 by 2 micrometers. They show active gliding motility where the parasites are gliding on a glass slide. All single zoites, sporozoites, and, as we shall see later on, tachyzoites are similarly structured. The zoite contains a basally located nucleus and other organelles, just like any other eukaryotic cell. A typical feature is the apical complex. It is composed of a conoid and three types of secretory organelles. Small vesicles, the micronemes, are believed to play a role in host cell recognition. The ropteries are elongated club-shaped organelles, eight to ten of which are found in each zoite. The third kind of secretory organelles are the dense granules, which will play a role after the invasion of the host cell. Infection of intermediate hosts occurs from oral uptake of oocysts containing sporozoites. Raw or undercooked meat containing tissue cysts loaded with invasive organisms named bradyzoites is a further source of infection. Once in the host, the parasite crosses the intestinal cells and starts multiplying in various cell types, such as macrophages, fibroblasts and neurons. At this stage, which is the acute phase of the disease named toxoplasmosis, a transplacental transmission is possible. This can be fatal to the fetus. The invasion of host cells can also be observed in vitro in tissue cultures. The invasion of host cells is based on active motility. Parasites glide on glass slides, on the cell surface, and even within the host cells. They always glide on a substrate. The mechanism is not yet fully understood, but involves an actomyosin motor located beneath the parasite membrane. The occurrence during the invasion will now be shown in detail. Having reached the host cell by gliding, the apical contact triggers signals that lead to the exocytosis of micronemes. Their contents create a stable bond between the parasite and host cell. The junction is then moved posteriorly. At the parasite apex, a vacuole forms, which develops further with the apical discharge of lytic substances from one or two of the ropteries. 
The vacuole membrane remains continuous with the host cell membrane throughout the process, but no host cell protein diffuses into the vacuole membrane. The vacuole membrane is a composite between host cell membrane lipids and ROPTRI contents. After internalization, the dense granules move to distinct exocytosis sites to be discharged into the vacuolar space. The released material accumulates and is gradually associated with contorted tubular structures termed the vacuolar network. Dense granule and ROPTRI proteins associated with the parasitophorous vacuole membrane are believed to participate in the organization of transmembrane pores. These may contribute to the nutrition of the parasite and leave free access to molecules up to 1500 Daltons. Finally, host cell endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria accumulate around the parasitophorous vacuole. Host cell invasion observed here in tissue culture only takes a few seconds. Apical contact is followed by smooth gliding inside the cell. The constriction at the site of entry can be seen during the whole process. Electron microscopy would reveal the moving junction here. After invasion, the parasite begins with its intracellular development. This is shown in a tissue culture of human fibroblasts. This is a close-up of an early vacuole. A major feature of the vacuole is that it never fuses with any other compartment of the host cell endomembrane system. Within the vacuole, the parasite begins to multiply. Multiplication is by repetitive binary fission and is referred to as endodiogeny. It is a very complex process where, after nuclear division, two daughter parasites form inside the parent organism. They will eventually emerge from the parent, which will gradually disappear, being progressively incorporated into the daughter zoites. Repetitive multiplications produce further parasites. They are called tachyzoites. Each division takes approximately 6 to 12 hours depending on the strain. The fastest growing parasite is usually the most pathogenic in vivo. The vacuole grows in size and will eventually occupy most of the host cell volume. It finally reaches a stage when the host cell cannot physically cope with further parasite development and ruptures. The egress in this case has been artificially triggered by calcium ionophore. Free tachyzoites will then disseminate throughout the entire host and infect new cells. Active invasion also occurs in macrophages, which are a most favoured host cell in vivo. In this case, the process is identical to what was shown before in fibroblasts. A moving junction is formed and invasion is completed within a few seconds, just as in any other cell type. When the host starts generating an immune response, tachyzoites are efficiently eliminated by macrophages. This mechanism of host defense, called phagocytosis, can be shown in cell culture. Phagocytosis is not oriented apically as with invasion. The parasite is surrounded by the cytoplasm of the macrophage and incorporated. This process lasts more than one minute. After phagocytosis, the parasite is killed and digested. Escaping parasites are able to maintain a chronic infection. These parasites developing in cysts are termed bradyzoites and grow mainly in muscular tissue. The cysts can persist for years. They are usually controlled by the host's immune response and remain quiescent within the tissue without causing any harm to the host. However, when the host suffers immunodeficiency, such as in AIDS or upon organ transplantation, the infection can be reactivated. 
Bradyzoites can be released and switch back to the tachyzoite stage. This acute phase can be fatal in humans. Cysts are the main source of transmission to final or intermediate hosts. A cyst is surrounded by a thin wall, which is made by the parasite as a deposit under the membrane of the parasitophorous vacuole in the host cell. Cysts can be isolated and aggregated by gradient centrifugation. The host cell is destroyed in this process. Bradyzoite release can be triggered by proteolytic enzymes such as trypsin, just as occurs in the gut of a carnivore after eating infected tissue. First, the bradyzoites invade enterocytes, later other tissues. There they multiply as tachyzoites, resuming the intermediate host cycle. Ingestion in the intestine of a cat leads to the invasion of enterocytes, where the bradyzoites undergo a typical coccidian cycle. In the epithelial cells of the duodenum, multiplication or schizogony takes place. The resulting merozoites invade neighboring cells. They develop first into macro and micro gametocytes, then into macro and micro gametes. This is known as gametogenesis. By fusion of the flagellated microgametes with the macrogametes, an oocyst is produced. Oocysts are excreted unsporulated. That means that they contain a single cell or zygote. The thick oocyst wall protects them against external influences and is extremely resistant to disinfection. It can persist infectiously for several months. Inside the oocyst wall, sporulation takes place. It lasts for about 30 hours and is shown here in time lapse. With this development phase, the life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii is completed. After oral uptake of these infectious stages, the cycle can begin again.